one of the reasons I wrote the book is people are like, how are you so optimistic about America? I'm like, because you know that line, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. Yeah. We've seen worse people who had more control, who were more intelligent and more um, evil and willing to go further, they lost and they lost relatively quickly and easily. So given that, it's not at all ridiculous to absurd, to believe, excuse me, that the same situation in a different context can be replicated or at least mirrored to some extent. All right, we're at the local studio here in Miami, and I am glad to be with my good friend, Michael Malice, who has written a book, very apropos, my friend, The White Pill, uh, which I believe is all about Betty White, who played, of course, Rose Nyland on The Golden Girls in Miami. So, Betty White, it's, your it's, feelings. It's actually more the case for white nationalism. <laughs> Did you ever see when she was I on? was only able to thumb through it so far. I could, it was half That's white nationalism, I, I, half Betty White. It's a very <laughs> odd combination, but I get you there at the end. you got to start back in uh, um, St. Olaf. So. so I kid you not, I mean, when I first saw the cover, whenever you released it, maybe six months ago as the teaser or whatever, I see this cover. The book, the book is absolutely beautiful, by the way, and I want to talk about the, the publishing part of it. But I see this cover, The White Pill, and there's a sort of sitcom -y, the font you guys use reminds me of like a 70s sitcom kind of thing. And I'm looking at these women here. And then Betty White. I'm thinking this is a whole. I honestly thought for a moment it's a whole book about the well, Golden Girls. Well, it actually. So can we just talk about the Golden Girls, which I know you're you're almost an expert at the level that I am. I think I'm more of an expert. You might be more. Yeah, I think if we had a Golden Girls trivia competition, I think I would wipe the floor with you. You have some of their clothes, don't you? You wear Blanche's no. negligees at night or something? I have Margaret Thatcher's dress. <laughs> and I'm serious. Yeah. And I have two of her bookcases in my house, which as an immigrant is such a sign of like, I've arrived. <laughs> uh, and let me tell you, like, you do not want to know how much it costs to get two 10 foot tall bookcases from London to Austin. It's a lot more expensive than the actual bookcases themselves. Yeah, I, well I want to talk about Austin too because you have fled New York. Yes. You were, a, you were a big time New Yorker. You were a Brooklyn guy. You did not want to leave, but you did. But hold on, first with the book. Yes. Uh, just some technical stuff. So you, you self-published this, right? Yes. This is a self-published book, but a hardcover released on Amazon. It's blowing up. Yes. You're taking out Mike Pence. Yeah, I'm- Like January 6th style, according to, no? No, I'm actually doing it for real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that was good. The, the, I am delighted that we are at a point in time, when you and I were kids, yeah. and people listen to this when they were kids, if you put out your own book, you're a crackpot. And in fact- Yeah, you're a complete nutbag. You're a complete nutbag, yeah. right? And in fact, yeah. I, I have a little hobby. Sometimes I'll get these old self-published books from like 60s, 70s, and you read them, and you think there's gonna be some nuggets in there, and it's really, really bad. Um, I, I have one book I just bought called Belial, the Rebel Angel. There's no references to it online, and it's the guy who meets this angel in prison and tells him about, thanks to quantum physics, all races are the same. It's, it's just, uh, I'm making it sound much more interesting than it is. But the fact that I can be competitive with, you know, Mike Pence, Obama, um, all these other major household names when I'm nowhere near their level in terms of name recognition just speaks to how much publishing has changed in recent years. And that in and of itself is a white pill because for over a century, if you want to get- Which again, it, white pill. White so pill book. I see what com, you did yeah. there. You said the title of the book in a sense. No, but so, I mean, yeah. I'm speaking to, to the, what the white pill is is yeah. an expression of hope. Yeah. So for a century, uh, you had, if you want, you couldn't have this show 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could have it on PBS, maybe you could have it on, you know, like Fox, maybe let's say 30 years ago. But in terms of publishing, you've got a, a handful of major publishers, which are shrinking. They're get, trying to buy each other out all the time. And if you don't get a book through one of those, you know, all these other outlets pretend you don't exist. Now, that is still the case. The New York Times will pretend I don't exist and, and Politico pretend I don't exist, sure. But in terms of me reaching an audience and telling a message, not only do I not have to go through a gatekeeper, I also have to waste the year of my life because mm -hmm. as you know, if you get a book deal today on like January 1st, 2023, it's probably gonna come out January 1st, 2025 at the earliest. Whereas yeah. with me, I had it done on a Monday and you know, I have it out you know, within a week or two, so. That was one of the things that I could not believe when I, you know, I did two books and I could not yes. believe, you're, I was like, wait a minute, if I write these things in a couple months, the first one I wrote basically in three months, I was like, I still have to wait a year? Yeah. And then suddenly when they're after that delay, 
it's like, well, I've moved on from some of those ideas at this point. Of you know, I try to write something timeless, but like things do move forward and you're like, man, this is archaic. Yeah, and publishers complain that like, you know, we're, we're consolidating and we're losing cloud and what are we gonna do about this? But there's not even a hypothetical mechanism for them to turn the ship around and that's a great thing. Uh, similarly in journalism, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the New York Times wasn't the New York Times, if the New York Times was not in that position to be the officiant and the dictator of, you know, public opinion for a large swath of the population, I think it certainly would be. Yeah, do you think it's fair to say that it's not anymore? I mean, I think something does feel like it's changing. It's been changing for a long time, but I almost think we're on the other side where it's like, if you were sitting next to somebody at a bar and they were reading the New York Times, if that's still a thing that people do, is that a thing that people do? Probably not. At, at bars, at a bar, bar. <laughs> or at a <laughs> coffee, coffee shop. shop. If yes. you were at a coffee shop and somebody was reading the New York Times, I would be looking at them like, man, that is a that is an ill-informed, confused person. Like, I, I think I, that has now t sort of gained more momentum than the person reading the time. Or you would think, oh, this person is posturing. They want you ah, to see yes, yes, that yes. I'm sitting here reading the New York Times. Coffee. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I think th with a certain segment of the population, uh, there were there were polls taken the last few years, and in terms of trust of corporate media outlets, just like the New York Times, and with independents and Republicans, the number has like collapsed. And once you lose trust, it's really hard to regain it. Someone's cheated on their spouse, you're never gonna look at them the same way again, because oh, that person has always been a cheater, even if they have learned their lesson, are you really ever gonna be sure? And when you have these organizations that just have constant propaganda, so on and so forth, but with the Democrats, the trust in corporate media has actually increased over the last few years. So Is what that right? Yes, so we're seeing this bifurcation, oh, good God, but yeah. if the New York Times wants to be the official house organ as you would put it, the left, that's fine. You know, people have much more of an issue with CNN, or at least CNN until the recent heads were rolling, than they had them with MSNBC. Yes. Maddow was, was a leftist, Chris Hayes was a leftist, they had their leftist point of view, go nuts, speak your leftist point of view. Fox has their right-wing point of view, Tucker, go nuts, you know, Sean Hannity, we know Sean Hannity's gonna say. CNN, like the New York Times, has this air of objectivity and neutrality, but when push comes to shove, they will always fall on the side of hard left. And I think that disingenuousness is what the issue people have with both the Times and formerly CNN, but they're decreasingly so. So it's kind of a beautiful thing across industries right now, because not only are you able to get this out independently and it's, it's selling incredibly well, that you were telling me right before we started, I mean, basically because it's hardcover, they, they, you can, they can't even catch up with the printing right. yet, which is, I tried to buy an extra copy this morning. It was literally two weeks yeah. till you could even get it. So it's doing really well. We happen to be sitting in a studio of a tech company that I started that you're huge on right. locals, malice.locals.com. We've started to actually build the things. I think there was this idea for the last couple of years that you know re Republicans, conservatives, anyone on the right, whatever we the hell we all are at this point, uh, we were just gonna complain about everything. But it does seem like it's turning. There were two models for this, right? So back in the, in the late 70s, I believe it was, early 80s, Roger Ailes was trying to start Fox and they wanted him to be like, okay, we want you to be competitive with CNN. He goes, I want to beat uh, CNN. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the other model was for a long time, people, I remember this in the early 2000s, people were like, we need to have a conservative daily show. And I don't think locals is the right wing version of anything. It's no. not trying to parallel something that the left has done successfully. So I think the way to succeed, and I don't think this is necessarily the right versus left is, do you want to ape? Do uh, you want to be like How I Met Your Father or do you want to do something that's original that you can't get elsewhere? And by doing it in that way, I think that creates new audiences. And when you have freshness and innovation, that's an apolitical thing. And historically, that has been a function of leftism. Leftism is very highly correlated with uh, innovation, with artistry. And it's only in recent years that you have the organizations that can in some sense be identified as conservative or right-leaning, whatever you want to call it, that have been creating things that are original or, uh, um, you know, modeling culture. Is, is that the craziest cultural shift you think we've had? That it's, because the lefties were supposed to be the creative ones. That's generally how it always was. The, right. o the openness, right? right. The, openness the conscientiousness, method, yes, yes. you're going to create great music and art and stuff like that. Now they've become the dogmatic ones and you have suddenly conservatives creating things. This is, this is like a massive psychological shift. I don't think in modern history, meaning let's say post-Civil War, has there ever been red states that are the centers of culture, right? In our childhood, it right, would right. be Boston, yeah. New, which is now kind of not a thing. Yep. Chicago was major when we were kids. Yep. Now it's not a thing at all in terms of creating culture, great food and so on and so forth, but it's not what Chicago was when Oprah and Phil Donahue were there, right? Yeah. In New York and LA, now, 
Austin and Miami are both becoming in their own way cultural hubs. Yep. I can't think of any, uh, Seattle was a cultural hub in, some, in, in a small way, Portland, Detroit. Um, none of these, but now to have a red state with, you know, Austin is, is a blue city very much. So Miami, I think, has a Republican governor, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, Republican mayor and, Republican and, and, and excuse governor. Me, Republican mayor, yeah. I meant. Um, this is historically in America culture unprecedented. And I don't know what it means, but I am looking forward to being, to already being the big fish in the small pond of Austin. Yeah, so let's talk about that because I haven't had you on for a while. I, st I still lived in that crazy LA and yeah. you still lived in that crazy Brooklyn. So we both made moves since we last sat down about a year and a half ago. Um, I take it you're happier in Texas than you were in New York. I didn't remember how I didn't realize how lonely New York had gotten towards the end. Yeah. Um, it was like Survivor. One by one of my friends, I don't mean people I've seen at parties, just people I like talk to on a regular basis moved away. They, 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 you know, you're playing poker at a certain point, like I'm out, yeah. I fold. I have just a, like a couple of friends left in New York. Uh, the majority of them moved to Austin. And to be able to have a social group is something that is wonderful. New Yorkers are told a lie. And I believe this my entire life which is, you know, these people who move out in New York, oh, they're weak, they can't hack it. And at a certain point, it does become like Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand's book. It's like, <laughs> why am I carrying this burden? Like, yeah. what, what is my upside here so I could stand up and say, look how tough I am, I'm a New Yorker. No one's ever gonna perceive me as tough. So well, there was a time where that had value, right? Sure, there sure. was a time when the toughness and the culture right. was there, but it just simply isn't there anymore. I went back over the summer. I hadn't been there for a whole year because Tim Pool had put up a billboard of me in Times Square. I'm like, I gotta oh, see, I gotta yeah, see yeah, some yeah, person, yeah, right? Yeah. This is bucket list stuff. Literally put you up in, in yes. Times Square, your uh, face, Tim Cast. Yeah, something. looking down at the yeah. messes as is my destiny. And <laughs> I was so angered uh, to see that all the places, because obviously a lot of the places I adored didn't survive COVID. You would think after a year there'd be healing, like people would be returning, you know what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm. I would say like a quarter of the storefronts were unoccupied. There was not this enthusiasm in the air. Um, there was really no place that I wanted to go necessarily. It is not fertile soil mm -hmm. to have a renaissance anymore. And that is something that even pre-Giuliani, I'd never experienced in my lifetime. New York's crime era, people don't realize, it was an opportunity because if you were like a poor artist who can handle living in dangerous streets, you could still get an apartment and you could still go there and create and make a scene. Yeah. And the rents are too high for that and everything else is too difficult. You're not going to be a, a cultural magnet as you were, you know, 20, 30, or, you know, 30 years ago in the 70s when, you know, the punk scene was so there. So what, what do you think happens to New York City? Because to me, it has not hit rock bottom yet. I, mean, I agree the, with the, you. The times that I've been there in the last two years, it's more depressing each time. There are no people doing business. That's what I always notice, even in, in uh, Midtown. So I've gone for Gutfeld, you know, so Fox is right in the middle of Midtown. It's supposed to be people in suits. That's what you used to see, groups of guys in suits going to lunch and doing business. Now it's just people in hoodies all walking alone. Everyone looks like they're up to no good. Uh, and the whole place smells like weed. And I'm not against weed as a general rule. And I know you're certainly not uh, against making it illegal. Right. But it shouldn't, the, the, your business center shouldn't smell like weed all day. It's kind of scary that having my face in Times Square isn't rock bottom. <laughs> I would have thought this is as low as we get, but apparently the basement has a cellar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the crime and is yeah. just something that I remember as a kid, you know, kind of in the background because I was much younger. But to have that kind of sense of, uns the, the thing that I think is the worst part is there doesn't seem to be any will yeah. or plan to turn it around. Now, if, if uh, Mayor Adams was like, let's try this, let's try that, or Governor Kochel was saying, you know, this is our plan to kind of- I have a lot of faith in her. But the they're way. not Great even lady. identifying issues. They're yeah. just kind of being like, oh, you're just making this up for propaganda purpose, New York is safer than ever. It's just like, okay, if people don't feel safe, that in and of itself is a problem. So why are they misperceiving, in your opinion, uh, this lack of safety? So a guy like you who strikes me, you're, you're such a New Yorker. Like yes, you are I don't a, still in, in, the, in the best sense of that, I mean that. So you go to Texas. Now you're in Austin, which obviously is a blue city yes. in a red state. Um, culture shock or did you just kind of just get there and you're oh, good to go? Well, it's kind of cute because some people come at me, they're like, you moved to the San Francisco of Texas. I'm like, yeah, the keyword here is of Texas. This is not needles on the street, right. uh, like complete Chesa Budin district attorney kind of situation. It's still very Texan uh, in its own but way. But there is, there's a pretty decent homeless uh, oh, the, no, there. we had a referendum. They cleaned them up. Is so that right? They, they, and okay, they good. Took them. It's not like, uh, no, no, it's not like back in LA. No, they, they used to be like LA. Yeah. Like the whole entire street was tense. I don't know where they went. Um, I, I, I don't really care at this point, but it, it, 
I mean, because you had, it was really, really bad. You could, yeah. I visited during COVID, I was doing Rogan and I wanted to go get ice cream and I had to take an Uber a few blocks because the streets were completely deserted and the only people on the streets were like literal junkies. I'm like, this is not a good uh, uh, look for me. This is not going to end well for me. But now it's, it's, it's just absolutely, I, I'm just very, very happy. The fact that I can own a gun in my own home uh, is just, just wonderfully reassuring because in new york you know I, I have cool stuff i put it on instagram yeah. sometimes if someone breaks into my house i can't defend myself or i'm going to jail they'll be much more likely yeah. to prosecute someone who defends their home with a gun than someone who breaks into the house now you know i if someone comes to my someone comes to my house even if they're my friend i can shoot them and it's texas and i'll have no repercussions if they so are come coming, on over dave <laughs> if they are coming for your blanche Devereux negligee they are going to get a bullet <laughs> in their ass it covers it exactly covers a perky bosom what is it about Austin that keeps it blue in a red state. So a state that's pretty functional, that's making sense and everything else. And then, and then there is this, there's artists there, obviously. It's, a, it's just a different thing. What, what is the blue Texan? Well, I, I like, think, what is that? Yeah, I think conservatives always talk about like, oh, these are the um, policies in all these Democrat run cities. There are no Republican run cities. If you look at the top 20 cities of a population, I think Miami is the only one with a Republican mayor. So cities are historically run by Democrats and there's a lot of reasons. One of the biggest reasons is if you're li living shoulder to shoulder with people, you have to have this liberal, probably more classical liberal sense of like live and let live. Because yeah. you can't really be in each other's business if you're just kind of this close. You have to kind of make these sacrifices in terms of being a busybody. Um, and some blue cities are obviously run very differently than others. There's a reason San Francisco can afford to have these massive rents. You know, as Detroit, you're selling houses for a dollar or Baltimore it is another one or New York versus LA there's different metrics that go into it um, it's so it's not at all to me uh, blue in the sense that LA was blue we're not people aren't wearing masks they're not having these stupid virtue signaling signs in the windows of the stores um, and I feel like Austin I, I think more than Miami and I, 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 I bet you'd agree with me has become this kind of um, beacon for people who are refugees within America. Like a you lot think of more than Miami? Yes. Why more than Miami? Because I'm seeing a, the beacon is freaking bright over here. I there may not be a perfect way to quantify it, but, well, but why I, do you think I say feel more? like Austin has more scenes than Miami does. So we have like the Bitcoin people, the. the um, we've got the Bitcoin people. I, hold on, hold on. We've I'm, got I'm, the Bitcoin I'm people. Very defensive. We've, we've, got, got, here, we've got a bigger stand up comedy scene, yeah. I feel, than New York. We've That's got a bigger yeah, podcast sure scene, true. I think, than New York. Yeah. Um, there's the. Oh, wait, are we talking about Miami? Uh, Miami, excuse me, Miami. There's a biohacker community. Whole Foods started. So that whole white people stuff uh, <laughs> thing happening in Austin. We have Whole Foods. <laughs> no, but it, you don't have Whole Foods culture. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like that, that stuff white people like where you're just right. trying to go to, you know, the spa and you do the cold plunge and then you do yeah. rock climbing, all that stuff. I absolutely, you know, I find anathema. So I feel like <laughs> that kind of thing is more, and I think Miami has more history than Austin. Miami's been a city for a lot longer as a major city than Austin has. So Austin is in some ways finding its own character now as opposed to Miami's has always been like a party town. Right. And we're not a party town. Right. I'm in the burbs. It's very yeah, quiet. Yeah, exactly. You You're know, a dad. There's, there's, I'm a dad. There's yeah. lizards. It's all very pleasant. <laughs> you know, it, when it gets cold, you know, iguanas fall out of the sky. You yes, know about I, this I, thing? I'm very they, familiar with they this. They have, like, they go unconscious and you yeah. can, yeah, it's There nuts. was an iguana in the you airport. You think you got problems. It's not a, what's the problem? It's the iguana's it's got the problem. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the book a little bit. Yeah. So the white pill. Now, before we get into the specifics of the book, I just want to talk about the concept of the white pill. Because yes. over the last couple of months when I'm doing my show, and it's like everything, they lie about everything, you know, the media lies about everything, the politicians lie, we do all the WEF stuff over the last couple yeah. of weeks. Oh, yeah. It's like there's lies everywhere. The morons seem, seem to be getting more moronic. Like everything seems to be so idiotic. But I always try to end my show with a white pill, like that there is hope. Yeah. And, and usually I frame that around what's going on in Florida and DeSantis, you know, from a political perspective, that there is a place that is a citadel of freedom, as he always says. So first off, did you always, is it built in you to have the, the white pill, the idea that there is something better on the other side, that we can get through all this stuff? Th this is and do you want to define the white pill exactly? For sure. Th th I'll, I'll, I'll define it at the end. This is one of my favorite criticisms when people tell me that, oh, you have too optimistic of a view of human nature. Michael Malice yeah. thinks people are genuinely kind and nice yeah, and yeah, doesn't yeah. see the dark side ever, the North Korea guy. Yeah. Um, you, the, what the white pill is, is simply shorthand, it's an expression of hope. And as I define it, it is 
it's possible that we, the people who fight for goodness, will lose. It's not possible that we must lose. Mm -hmm. And you in, just in yourself gave the white pill. You can't look at the w WEF people and all these other villains in our culture and be like, I can't stop these guys. They, they, they're going to run the table on me. These are often clowns. Yeah. They're, they're much more akin to clowns than they are to gods. But there's this belief among some people, especially among conservatives. Conservatives take a lot, you know, my famous expression is conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. Yeah. Conservatives have taken from progressivism this idea subconsciously, they'll never say it publicly or explicitly, that being a victim is a mark of status, right? You talk about the victim elliptics, you know, yeah. or like, oh, where does a black lesbian compare to like a Native American paraplegic, right? Depends but, on the day. Depends, right. But conservatives love talking about how you know, we're getting uh, um, attacked on Twitter, we're, you know, I'm, I can't speak my mind on, on Facebook, at my work, so on and so forth. And that's all well and good, but part of that often many conservatives feel like, well, there's nothing we can do. It's, 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 it's America's done. Yeah. You know, we're going to be destroyed in a couple of years. And my point is, you call yourself a patriot. Well, hold, uh, we call you yourself a patriot. Yeah. If you're a patriot and you think Joe Biden or any person can destroy America in two years, take that flag off of your profile pic. Because if America is so weak that one administration, especially the Biden administration, can destroy this country irrevocably, I, I, I'm not even saying the Biden himself, the Biden people. I think not only you're not a patriot, I don't think you're a, a, an impressive person because that's just to me is an absurdity. This is America. Like we, are, you know, uh, Reagan is a major figure in this book, mm -hmm. and he gave this speech. You know, I cite in the book in 1964, advocating for Goldwater, right? And we're sitting here in Miami with a huge Cuban population, and he was recounting an anecdote of you know he had two friends, and one of them's talking to his Cuban refugee friend, and goes, you, you know, you're you're uh, you're so lucky you, you could escape here, and the Cuban guy goes to him goes. I had somewhere to escape to. Yeah. If it goes down here, there's nowhere for you to go. This is the last stand on earth. And I, it was true then, it's true now. I, I'm so glad. Part of the reason I wrote this book, which is about the Soviet Union, I was born in the Soviet Union, yep. and I'm like, okay, how bad was it? And I couldn't be in the position I am now mm -hmm. if I had remained in the Soviet Union or later became Ukraine. So one of the things, uh, we just got the book this morning, as I said, so I was only able to read a little bit, but one of the things you talk about in the book is that people don't really realize how bad it is yes. until it's too late and often will actually welcome in their oppressors. And I feel like we have a very specific version of that right now. Yeah, one of the things that surprised me to learn while writing this book is after the Berlin Wall fell and Germany reunified, so the Stasi were the secret police in East Germany and they were much more, they were different from the KGB, which is the Russian version, because they played mind games. Uh, they had something called Zersetzung, which was translates as corrosion or disintegration. And their goal was to drive targets insane. So they would do things like they'd break into your house and leave your like socks on your pillow. Right. And then they do it tomorrow and they do the day after. And you have to sit there. You're like, did I forget to do this? But then like, I didn't forget to do this. But then why is someone breaking into my house and putting my socks on my pillow? Why aren't they stealing my watch or my wallet? Mm -hmm. And you start to go crazy. And this was by design. Um, after the Berlin Wall fell, East Germany what later became unified, re re reunified Germany. They opened up the Stasi files. So you could go and look at who, what did they know about you, and you could look at who spied on you and who informed on you. And this was an enormous question for everyone who's from East German. Do you want to know who was spying on you, and do you want to know who turned you in? And it's not like someone down the street. It was often brother-in-law, sister, your best friend since college who'd been recruited. Now, we think, I thought at least, while writing this book, it would be like this. Ruben's taken in, gun to your head, and they're like, all right, give us 10 names, and you give me up, and I don't blame you. You're like, all right, Malice, you know, it's, yeah. it's Shapiro, it's Jordan Peterson, it's Governor Sanders. Yeah, we're all conspiring together. Just leave my kids alone, right? right. What actually happened is the Stasi recruiter said, a lot of these people were just bored. We didn't have to put pressure on them. They came to us mm -hmm. because they wanted to feel important. They wanted to feel like they were doing the right thing. They wanted someone to just actually listen to them. We barely paid them anything. And when you hear this, you know, speaking to me like having a naive view of human nature, people in America need to appreciate, and I think COVID opened a lot of people's eyes, yeah. how eager the average person is to be an informant on their neighbors. It's not like you think in the movies where Tom Cruise has a gun to his head and he's like, Arr, and he's like, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, name names. No, no, it's like they knock on your door and they're like, hey, I saw Dave and Malice you know, having a talk. Maybe they're up to something. You should go check them out. And now he feels like a big shot. Yeah, that's a uh, 
Did, did you never think, I mean, because you are obviously uh, fairly well-read and have been around the world, when, when COVID was happening and, you know, we were hunting down people at stores for not wearing masks, yeah. which I always thought was the funniest, the crazy woman in the mask hunting down the guy for not wearing a mask, you'd think you'd be running the other way, but they were always running to tackle them. Um, did it's you? Like, it's, did like you a, it's like it's like a zombie movie. It's like it's I better like go <laughs> fight those zombies. Like, no, 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 go away from the zombies. Right, it was a reverse zombie movie, yeah, something right, like that. Yeah. It was like zombie Bizarro Land, but but that sort of thing. I mean, when it was unfolding and you were in Brooklyn, which you know, so you're on top of people quite literally, yes. right? Like you literally have people right above you and right below you. Did you think that it was going to unravel so quickly? I I I was very surprised. I was very surprised. Uh, I had this tweet, which I got a lot of pushback for, and I stand by very much, where I said, if you, because if, one of the big questions uh, that humanity always asks is, how did Hitler come to power and how did those atrocities were allowed to happen? Because we got to make sure whatever those steps were aren't replicated in any other country or any other population. And this was always like, was it something uniquely about the German people? It's something uniquely about him? Was it the economic conditions? Was it the Weimar situation? And what I, I think people just learned, I, I tweeted out, I said, you know, if you replace the word uh, Jews with coronavirus, suddenly the behavior of the 1930s German population becomes a lot clearer. Yeah. Oh, how can you say this? And I the point this is, one, yeah. the point is, if you, it, we saw, no matter where you stand on COVID, no matter where you stand on vaccination, you saw how effectively the media, maybe even correctly, created an outgroup, the vitriol, with which people were attacked, the glee. I'm glad they're getting fired. These people should be driven from polite society. They shouldn't be allowed to leave their homes. They shouldn't be allowed to get jobs, blah, blah, blah. Even after it was clear that vaccination is not gonna prevent you from getting COVID, it's only gonna prevent the severity of your illness. So, and by the way, that's even unclear but, at this but point. Let, let's, I'm just trying but, to steal men yeah, yeah. as much as possible, right? Okay. So I'm trying to look at it from their perspective. Yeah. Even given all that, the, ex the hatred and the lack of perception of those who are in opposition as human. And also the idea that like, you want me to die. Mm. So why should I care about you at all? When you saw that mass drop and you saw how prevalent it was, I think that was very revelatory for a lot of people. And it was surprising to me uh, as an American because I thought America would have a lot more pushback than it had. Um, but that's just kind of information you have to choose and go forward with. So as a guy that obviously is not for a lot of laws, to say the Cor least. Correct, yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, they come in with mandates and shots and they're firing people and all of this stuff. And then it all turns out, in essence, at least from my opinion, to be completely unwarranted. I fortunately was against all of it the entire time. I am not vaxxed. They will never inject this stuff in me, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, can I interrupt? Yeah. It's also different now that you're a dad, right? Because now yeah. if your kids are threatened, it's a very different calculus. So what do you think about this theory? I've said this a couple of times on the show. I think that one of the reasons they went so deep on uh, vaxxing the kids who were at no risk, right. they were never at any risk, was not because of the kids. It was because they figured somehow, they figured that if you can get a parent to, it's one thing to do it to yourself, right? And then have to deal with the repercussions if there's a vaccine injury or something else. But once you can get a parent to do it to their child, if you now find out the child has, uh, you know, enlarged heart or a series of other problems that are now arising, your ability to deal with that reality, that you had something to do with it, is so shattering. You can almost do anything with that person at that point. Do you think there, there's something there? Uh, absolutely. And here's the other thing. From their perspective, I, I've never even heard a counter argument to this, really. And, and people can feel free to yell at me all they want on social media. The argument is, because we know the vaccine has limited efficacy, efficacy, right? So you're saying this kid who can't get COVID is going to get boosters, every an injection every six months in perpetuity? Like that's what you're positing. And I don't understand even a bad reason for that. Uh, there still is, I'm not a COVID expert at all, but I still have not seen any argument for or against um, symptomless transmission. That seems to kind of be swept under the rug. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very, very sinister um, when you have kind of going after people's kids. And also the other thing is they have turned children from the perception of parents as vectors of disease. Mm -hmm. So that's a mechanism to kind of separate the kid from the parent in some, in some uh, um, psychological sense. So I, I, I think all this stuff is very sinister, but, and I wanna hear, uh, if I could ask a question, yeah. I thought that all of these mandates and vaccine passports were never going away. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they receded at all in many of these cities is something I was surprised about. Were you? 
I'm not surprised that they went away in the red states as really as DeSantis. Well, no, then, but like in New York yeah, City, you, yeah, have, yeah, yeah. you don't have to have a vaccine no, no. to go to a restaurant anymore. So I, I'm not surprised that once things started, once the narrative shifted a little, little bit, that the red states really did right. the right thing. Because they didn't all do the right thing. You know, people think right. that the red states all did the right thing immediately. It's not the case. And even DeSantis, by the way, did lock down here yeah. at, at the beginning. But then, you know, people want to get him on this. But it's like then he learned after two weeks. It was like, no, 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 no more. So, okay, there's that. Um, on the blue cities, I did think that it was going to hold a little bit longer yeah. than it did. So that at least has been nice, but it's left the cities. The, the rest of the residue of it, ha I think, has left the cities with all sorts of problems and all the good people left, right? As you said, all your friends, they left. So they were most likely somewhat functional members of society. But it's an And now they've brought their skills to Austin and families. But and it's an else. intriguing question, and I don't have an answer as to why I was wrong and why they did pull back. Um, and also, at, at, at the same time, it's still illegal for a foreigner to visit America unless they're vaccinated. They just got extended through They April. just extended it. So there is a, um, incongruity here. And well, I- Well, do you think it's possibly that it's, you can't do everything at once? So this was the first salvo. Let's see how far we can push it. We, we now, you know, we were able to basically grade the pushback and now we'll do it again, sort of like in Canada. Like you push back a certain amount on the truckers, you see how much pushback there is. And then of course Trudeau is gonna do something else in a year. But like I, that you can't, I, you can't just ram through everything in one but shot. But the thing is they had rammed it through. They had, so why didn't they normalize vaccine passports in restaurants? Cause that would be a very effective tool. And especially they have the app, right? So now you have an app to see who's going to which restaurant under what conditions. I'm shocked that that went away at all. You think maybe it was because they were they were shocked in terms of the population transfers? Like the numbers are nuts, the amount of people that, that, that have left that, Blue States. And, and, and it's and also the whole brain drain thing, right? Yeah. So this was a thing in, Ameri in Europe and America yeah. in the 70s and I think 60s where you had these onerous tax, uh, uh, income tax in different European countries. I know this is an issue in Britain and all the doctors and engineers and other you know uh, uh, established professionals, they started fleeing to America. It's like, why am I paying 90% of my income when I, got, I'm a, I have a high skill job? I, provide for my family when I could do that much better in the state. So th th that is something that has a historical precedent to it as well. So in that, both of us who pay attention to the culture wars, wary of state power, all that stuff, that you know, we got some of this stuff wrong too. I mean, everybody did. And I always say, I grant that the first couple of weeks, I grant everybody the leash. This was the first time, and this was out of a textbook. So even if you know everything about oppression, we all got whacked out for those first couple of weeks. Um, do you sense that it will all come back? Or do you think that the pushback that you're describing actually has now like irreparably damaged the machine or something like that? Uh, I think we are reaching, a, we're playing brinksmanship because whatever you think of Biden, whatever you think of DeSantis, Biden has an enormous incentive to crack down on Abbott and DeSantis and other rogue Republican governors. Mm -hmm. Abbott and DeSantis and Christy No, maybe to some extent, some other Republican governors, they are playing to the base when it's like, all right, I'm gonna give the finger to Washington and I don't know who's going to, and we just saw with the Kevin McCarthy thing where you had 20 Republicans who were like, I'm not voting for the establishment candidate come hell or high water. They folded after some concessions were made, but that's still within the same party. So I don't, and there is explicit talk in Democratic circles that, you know, the January 6th Republicans, the Republicans are un-American and, you know, want to destroy the Republican democracy itself. I would to God that that was true. Um, <laughs> So I don't. You still got him out. Uh, thank you so much. I, I don't know where this escalation goes, but it's certainly a direction that I am very enthusiastic about. Right. So you're enthusiastic because uh, basically, if the states just all went their separate way at this point, if, yes. the, if the federal government was completely broken at the knees, you would be totally fine with that, right? I would be giddy, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, I basically would be at this point. I, 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 well, I, I just see no way around it. I, I think there's, I think the inherent problem is that the blue states will not stop encroaching on the red states. But if, if Florida and Cali and Tennessee and a couple other states were just like, we're, we're out. I don't even mean, I don't mean a civil war. I mean, just like, we're just, all of our resources, we're just getting everything out of the system. The blue states will not stop. They're not gonna want anything from the blue states, but the blue states will keep coming. But this is something, I, this is one of the major themes of the book, yeah. right? So, and we're dealing with like the Soviet Union who, I'm sorry to offend the conservatives, are much, much worse than the Biden administration. Yeah. Like, let, let's, let's have some perspective. Um, they did not want to stop either. But at a certain point, they did stop. And they didn't stop because they became nice people. They didn't stop because all of a sudden they recognized the value of human life or they regard the value of markets. There were steps that took place before they had to stop and completely lose. And that's the whole point of this book. It's like, mm -hmm. how did these people build themselves up? And then how were they defeated relatively peacefully? Um, 
And a lot of that, to spoil the book, to, but to apply it in American context, is a function of will. And a great example of this is marijuana legalization, right? Marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. Yeah. Uh, when you had different states legalize it, they legalized it at the state level and they said, we're going to open dispensaries. And for a while, even in California, these dispensaries were being legally and understandably raided yeah. by federal agents because they're like, I don't care what Sacramento says, this is illegal in the federal level. You are brazenly breaking the law. We can't have this. While Barack Obama was president, yes. too. It's not as if it was just under a scary Correct. Republican president. And yeah. at a certain point, they're li like, it was like, the costs of doing this outweigh the benefits. And even now, drugs are different legal. I, I think Oregon just had like almost complete drug decriminalization. It's still on the federal level completely legal. And at a certain point, it's like, OK, the costs of enforcing this, and I don't mean just the financial costs, you know, the political costs, psychological costs, whatever costs, are, uh, cultural costs are too high. And they just basically had to give up. So that gives you hope, relating that to something you said earlier about how the, the WEF guys, that maybe they're more clownish, I think that you said, than, than godlike. It's like, so if we just keep pushing, that's what I was thinking all week. You know, I was watching some of the Al Gore, you saw Al Gore ranting and raving like a lunatic. I was like, this is not a guy who's confident in his ideas. Right. This is not a guy who's got a lot. This is like, I mean, he struck me as like Alex Jones adjacent. I don't even mean that to put down Alex Jones. I mean, like the level of like screaming in theater, I was like, Something doesn't seem right here. You, you, you don't have to act like that if you're running the table. Yeah. If you go to Vegas, right, 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 right. right and you, you, the dealer <laughs> who's going to win, the yeah. you know, odds are in his favor, you don't see the blackjack dealer. Th <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the guy who's turning over the table is the one playing blackjack, right. the one who's uh, in the losing position. Um, so I think that we are in a very hopeful time. I think the number of Americans who are aware of... Uh, the gun controls is another great example. Yeah. 20 years ago, you'd have the gun control people and then the gun rights people, and they'd be arguing. And at a certain point, and I don't know what the turning point was, the gun rights people are like, we're not even having this argument because you're not arguing in good faith. You say you don't want to take our guns. We know you do. We understand why. It's a non-starter. Every time there's a, a tragedy, which is absolutely a tragedy, which w we would love to be able to prevent, you use as an excuse to take my weaponry and my ability to protect my family from the bad, from, from the bad guys. Yeah. It's like there's not a conversation to be had. So I think that kind of understanding, I think, and it comes from both sides. I think uh, from blue states, they just think these MAGA people completely out to lunch, mindless. They're in a cult. They love Trump. There's, not, there's nothing to talk to them about. That to me is, is healthy. Uh, I don't think political discourse can work toward freedom. I think political discourse always works like when the two parties come together, you have war and you have these massive expansions in the state. When have the two parties come together to decrease, to increase freedoms and decrease the power of government? That's not a thing. Maybe after World War II when they shrank the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe like, they've come together every now and again to bomb the hell out of somebody. Sure, it makes right. us feel good for a few days, right, right. usually. But not them. You know, not, not the getting guy bombed. Guy. And those people grow up. Right. Um, so, all right. So let's bring it back to the book for a second. So the book basically is about the fall of the Soviet Union. And the Union rise, yeah. And, the, yeah. and then afterwards, the white pill is, is afterwards and now. But there's a lot of weird stuff going on in that part of the world right now. Well, that's true. So one of the points I make is people have this, you know, I'm an anarchist, as you know, and people both say anarchism is utopian and then condemn it for not providing one. Utopia is not possible, but wins are, progress are, I don't mean the sense of progressive, I mean moving in the right direction. And we see them all the time and constantly, and, and just one example is the fact that they folded on those uh, um, vaccine por passports. I don't think that's a net win. I mean, it's a net loss. It moved in the wrong direction. But the point is, guns is another example. The fact that if you look at Wikipedia, uh, the amount, it used to be almost impossible to get like a, um, a shall issue uh, you know, in different states. And now it's, it's become part of the Constitution in many different states. Uh, the fact that you have all these states brazenly defying Washington. Drug legalization is another one, whether you like it or not. The fact that you have states who are willing to uh, you know, have markets that are in defiance of federal law, that is a step in the right direction. So, uh, and I think the, uh, th for a long time, and this kind of harkens back to like the Rush Limbaugh era, there was this idea that's Republicans versus Democrats. And now I think if I talk to most people and they say, who do you think is more of a pernicious influence in American culture, 50 Democratic senators or 50 um, uh, executives of the New York Times, they're all going to say the New York Times and right. they're going to be right. So the fact that you're identifying where this toxicity is, and malevolence is coming from, uh, you're, you're shooting at the wrong people. And I'm saying that figuratively, please. 
<laughs> yes, we will make note of that. Yes, I don't want to be Sarah Palin, yeah. Li li uh, literally. Um, but it is weird, right? Because you'd think that more people at this point, well, uh, you're saying basically that enough people recognize it. And, and increasingly. Yet, and yet these things never change their tactics, right? So I always say, it's like, you guys, the, the New York Times, mainstream media, CNN, it's like, you guys don't have to be good. You really don't, but just don't be patently horrible. But they seem incapable of even doing That's that. That's the thing. They're, first, they're, there's an accusation that conservatives have echo chambers. There's some truth to that. But the amount of echo chamberism on you know, the people who read the New York Times is just through the roof. Right. Uh, there's no perception that anyone who is in the out group can have any even, not only just a good idea, but just simply valid criticism. Look what they did to Elon Musk. Oh, they, they loved Elon yeah, Musk. Yeah, 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 yeah right, yeah. Though, right? He's saving the planet, and now he, you know, he's, he's uh, basically Trump Jr. somehow. Um, so there is this kind of increasing siloization of American culture, but that's really bad because if I'm in power, and I want to maintain my power, and I see that there's this big part of the population that is a threat to my power, even if my power is illegitimate and malevolent, I still got to know who's coming at me, what are the metrics, so on and so forth, and they're just talking in circles. And I remember in 2016, after Trump won, and this was a huge like wake up moment for many people, uh, the, the head of the Times, I think Dean Banquet, was just saying like, okay, we got to do better, like we missed the mark here, and that kind of went out the window very, very quickly. Completely went out the window. Give me the white pill on the, on the tech situation, because we, okay, so we are here, and again, you're, you're on Locals, malice.locals.com, I'm a professional. Uh, we, there are things being built. Rumble is building things, there are, Bitcoin, I know crypto's hurting right now, but like, there are decentralization things. It's not All of well, hold on, crypto's not hurting, crypto's cheap. Right, so crypto is cheap, so it's yes. probably good, but I meant hurting in, yeah. the, in the sort of like broad sense of it's not, you know, Bitcoin's not at 70 grand, which it sure, was, you know, sure. a year ago. Um, but on the tech side, it still does feel like we got all this information that the government literally is colluding with big tech to silence us. Like, quite literally, there's evidence of it. It's all out there. I don't think these NPCs, blue, blue people, I don't think they care. They don't care. They're mindless. I think they're, yeah. But I mean, I don't think they're relevant. Like, if you, it's, see, this is an argument I have a lot with people who are for democracy, and, and I, I can't get, seem to get through to them, and it's just very frustrating. When you go to a farm, right? The farmer is always going to be out. Who would you rather have on your side, the farmer or the 100 cows? Then it's not a numbers game. You're making it a numbers game because yeah. you've been taught since you were a kid yeah. that the numbers determine what happens, but that's completely false. And one obvious example was Obamacare. The Democrats had super majorities, and so they had the numbers in terms of politicians, yeah. but the population was like 70, 30 against it, 60, 40 against it. They put it through anyway. So politicians use democracy and the masses as a mechanism to validate that which they wanted to do anyway. But if the popular support isn't there, they're still gonna push ahead. They don't care. All they care about is their power and their agenda. So yes, there's a, a big, percentage of population who are functionally mindless. And I don't think this is exclusive to blue states or blue people at yeah, all, yeah. blue voters at all. But to me, they're just largely irrelevant. I think what matters is, are you going to attract the quality minds? Are you going to attract the people who are innovators, who are moving culture forward? I, I, if Elon Musk voted Democrat, Democrat party line, but he was doing what he, Matt Taibbi's not a right winger. Glenn Greenwald is a, a hardcore lefty. Yeah. So uh, Jimmy Dore is another one. I, I don't know if there's yeah. beef with you and him, but whatever. No, no, we, sat, we settled it. Okay, good. Not, good. not even publicly. We did okay. it privately. I've never said it on air oh, before. That's, I just had my show. Totally it was great. Yeah. I don't agree with him on a lot, yeah. but I mean, when you have people who are honest and have a left-wing perspective, that's fine. Yeah. And, and who are a threat to those in power. That's, you know, there's so much talk about how journalism is speaking truth to power. And one of the things, this drives me crazy, because conservatives always say, oh, when I was a kid, journalists were honest. No, when you were a kid, you were a kid. <laughs> when you were a kid, you think no one has sex, yeah. no one does drugs, no one yeah. drinks, because you don't see it, because you're a kid. So you're gonna be oblivious to all these lies and machinations and, and um, misdirection. But one of the things I talk about in the book is, they've been at this for over a century and have the receipts when the New York Times, literally New York Times, was covering up the starvation of the Ukrainians and the Holodomor. There's a great book called Buried by the Times, which talks about how they obscured Hitler's assaults on the Jews because that would be validating his view mm -hmm. that Jews are separate race. So these, we all, I, I keep making this point constantly and I hope people understand it. We all learn in high school about yellow journalism, right? And how they led us into the Spanish-American War during William yeah. McKinley, yeah. and there's a record scratch and the journalists are honest, and then like 20 years ago they became dishonest. It's the same people, it's the same thing for over a century. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I think it's, uh, I think people think about it a lot somehow that the NBC Nightly News and ABC Nightly right. News, and that it was all even keeled and whatever, but it was like, 
It couldn't have been. It just couldn't have been by every estimation of what we know about how humans operate. And, and I'm sorry to all the boomers listening to this, but Walter Cronkite was a lot closer to Brian Stelter than he is to you. And your life will be a lot easier and things like a lot, make a lot more sense when Even you appreciate Even the JFK that. moment? Even the, especially the JFK moment. Especially the JFK moment. Um, but what about the fact that they still are colluding to silence us? So I get it. They're losing their, there's a certain set of people that are always going to be for it. The machine may be losing its power to do things, things, but it did things that are direct assaults on our rights. Here. Right. Yes. Uh, there's, there's not a dispute. The question is, is it, are we in a better position that now we can have the receipts and discuss it and look at it? Or would, so Thomas Sowell, who you've had the privilege and I'm very yeah. jealous that you got to talk to him, not going to lie. Um, he often talks about how people don't understand. He touched this hand. Do you want to touch this hand? Maybe. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, he often talks about how people often don't appreciate the concept of trade-offs. Because sometimes it's not going to be like, you know, do I want a, a, a Rolls Royce or do I want a garbage truck? Sometimes it's do I want this garbage truck or that garbage truck, right? You have two bad choices. So a lot of t it, the choice isn't between utopia and, and hell. It's like, would you rather have what we had 10 years ago mm -hmm. when they could have done all this stuff and you'd never know about anything? and everyone would get away with it scot-free, or would you rather have it now, where not only do you know who did what, you have in writing what they did, and you could have a conversation about it. This isn't where I want to be, the second choice, but in terms of, is this an improvement in the right direction? I think it's night and day an improvement mm. in the right direction over it was before. Uh, and, and I think the trajectory in this context is wonderful because tech people, many of whom are completely apolitical, do understand that corporate America, meaning the corporate press, or government actors are often a virus to navigate around and that they have their own uh, pernicious agenda. All right, so I want to finish with a, a technical part of the pilling of America. Yes. So you people generally know, let's describe each pill for a second. So okay. We, okay, so blue pill first. Let's talk about if, this because this yeah. also another one drives me crazy. Yeah. People so are like, oh, there's too many pills. Yeah, okay. If you can understand I like the clown pill Hold lately. I've been big on the clown if, pill. If, but if you can understand a traffic light, which yeah. has three, <laughs> if that's too much for you, I'm sorry, I can't help you. For everyone else, yes. it's two let's sets of pills. It. Okay. The red pill and blue pill. Yeah. The red pill is the belief that that which is presented as factual by the corporate press is in reality a carefully constructed narrative designed to keep some very unpleasant people in power. That's the red pill. Thank you, Morpheus. Okay, yes. That's Morpheus, yes. right? Yes, yeah. the blue pill is the view that the experts are generally good people who sometimes make mistakes but should be deferred to and listened to and what we see in the media is by and large factual and truthful and can be relied upon even though sometimes they make mistakes but they do their best to correct those mistakes, right? Okay. The black pill is, it's a wrap. It's done. America, the West and or America is a lost cause. Yeah, we're gonna have some small victories along the way, but given whatever trajectory the person speaking wants, yeah. we can't turn the ship around and there's no hope in trying. The white pill is, it's not possible to look at the enemy class and say, we can't win against yeah. these people. And, and when you put in those terms, to me, it's almost ridiculous not to be white pill. Right. It's it's actually very empowering. Right? Yes. Uh, and the re I'm sorry, just one more thing. The reason I wrote one of the reasons I wrote the book is people are like, how are you so optimistic about America? I'm like, because you know that line, history doesn't repeat; it rhymes. Yeah. We've seen worse people who had more control, who were more intelligent and more um, evil and willing to go further. They lost, and they lost relatively quickly and easily. So given that, it's not at all ridiculous to absurd, to believe, excuse me, that the same situation in a different context can be replicated or at least mirrored to some extent. So you, you basically asked my last question, so maybe I'll let you make up your own question, but I was gonna basically say, so, so for my audience, let's say, that is largely red-pilled. They, they don't believe the elite class anymore. They don't believe the nonsense. They see what's you know, approximate to truth, something like that. You get red-pilled for a while, and then what seems to happen to a lot of people is you still think you're losing along yes, the way. Yes, yes, that happens and a then, lot. Yep. And, right, so then that shifts them to the black pill. Yeah. So I think you just answered the question, but, but what do you find is the best, is that really it, just to show them that this elite class, they're not that good, this isn't the best of the best, so don't stay in that black pill situation for too long because I, you, you know can what else get is? to the white pill, I, I right? think conservatives are very bad at, taking, at, at uh, uh, celebrating a victory. So one of the reasons I wrote this book is, you know, I was on a conservative podcast and I'm like, why aren't you guys talking every five minutes 
about how Reagan and Thatcher were instrumental in ending the Cold War, which was the central foreign policy issue for decades in this country. And now no one even talks about it. So right. I have to write this book. I'm like, you're, the New York Times isn't going to tell that story. Why aren't you talking about this all the time? This was such a great, a major accomplishment that freed half the world and made things so much better for so many people. And then my brain's like, you know, hey, asshole, you, you tell stories. Why don't you tell that story? So that's what I did. So basically, you did a Homer. Uh, I'm a guy like me, <laughs> right? Yes, that's what you did. That is, that's I'm true. a guy like me, <laughs> yeah. and that was it. Yeah. You got anything else? Should I ask you about the suit or corduroy in Miami? I mean, what else? Anything else you want to do here? Well, I, I, I wanted to, it's like a 70s book cover. I did a 70s look yeah. for you. Yeah. No, no, I got it. I just thought if you had any other thoughts that you wanted to share or... My I have to say your hair is looking fairly normal these days. You've had some odd choices over the years. <laughs> I, he, in all seriousness, whenever I do a show like this, I regard it as an opportunity to have fun. Because I think if you do not, and this is something Reagan did very well, if you do not have this sense of joy, yeah. uh, and you know, Al Smith, who was a Democratic candidate in 28, was called the happy warrior, if you, I believe, if you don't have this sense of joy, you're not gonna be able to get people over to your side. And for a long time, you know, progressivism had every actor, every musician, so and so forth, they're all the fun people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't fight a regime unless you fight it with laughter and happiness and smiles. And this is Michael Malice speaking. So, uh, I, and I wish more people who, were doing appearances saw them as opportunities to kind of you know put put some clothes on that are kind of fun and and uh, put on a show for people like you and I both know that for so many people in the audience like this is their only chance to kind of have the experience of speaking with people who have political views that are similar to theirs yeah. or at least have thought provoking conversations they don't have that in their school or maybe in their town so uh, insofar as we can make them feel seen and make them feel as part of a community locals.com is one of them uh, I think that's just a great thing and I think that's before social media we didn't have that because you'd have that one weird anarchist in his high school he didn't know anybody <laughs> else and now you can go and have this kind of community with others and not just on local there's me on the internet itself yeah. and all of a sudden you feel less like a weirdo and more like an elite it's a good time for anarchists you it guys is can get on the computer and talk to each other yeah it's very exciting yes for you. yeah and all you right. could put out a book and 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 put the former vice president of uh, the united states in his place it's the number one book for m over a month now on, in communism so if people are learning about communism through me i think that's only a good thing as, as we sit here in miami here's what we're going to do yeah we're going to end this okay i will go out with you because you've got some friends in town. Yes. And I want to show you that Miami's better than Austin. I want to show you that Florida's better than Texas. Okay. I want to show you that the Golden Girl House is actually in Los Angeles. I know. And that was yeah, very depressing for me. <laughs> and that it's not even was, a house. It's, it's like not, a front. I know, I know. It's a, well, they have the house. The exterior was on the Disney lot, which eventually burned down. But the house house itself. They bur it burnt down? The Disney lot burned down in like 95 or oh, something. Wow. And like Shady and, Pines. And yeah, like Shady <laughs> Pines. It was because of the s'mores. You got it. Yes, sir. You got it. Good to see Always you. Always a pleasure, Alice. Dave. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics, instead of mindless drivel, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.